Hello and welcome to Helios Blog. My name is Helios here for another reaction video. Today, Jordan Peterson describes what women don't understand about men. Let's get into it. The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. What's the difference between men and women? Well, how do they differ? Well, the first thing we might observe is that if you look at personality differences be, be, between pu prepubescent boys and girls, they're not very large. Boys and girls don't differ in terms of their, their trait neuroticism, for example. What happens is that when puberty kicks in, women's trait neuroticism rises, and it stays higher than men for the rest of their life. And this is why you, you see this reflected in the different kinds of psychopathology that beset the two sexes. So men are overrepresented in alcoholism, drug abuse, antisocial personality, and a, a host of learning disorders as well as attention deficit disorder. And women are overrepresented in depression and anxiety, primarily. That seems to be tightly associated with higher levels of trait neuroticism. Because maybe it's, if you're at the 95th percentile or higher, let's say, in trait neuroticism, there isn't much different than difference between that and being somewhat prone to depression and anxiety. Okay, so what's the idea? Agreeableness versus neuroticism. Or disagreeableness versus neuroticism is what he's getting at. And because the curves overlap, you know, the, 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 the curves aren't identical, the normal distributions aren't identical for men and women, you tilt the one to the, to the right, to the w women's curve to, to the right towards higher levels of neuroticism, you go out and you look for the person in 20 who has the highest levels of negative emotion. It's much more likely to be female than male. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out why. So, I'm going to tell you some things, basic differences between men and women, and you can tell me what you think about it if you, or if you agree or disagree. Okay, first, size differential emerges between men and women at puberty, right? Because boys and girls are roughly the same size and roughly the same strength. But right. So once men and women or children go through puberty, what happens? Men get bigger. And what's the point? Well, men are the fighting gender, right? They're meant to be the protectors. And so they're bigger. Also, they're stronger. Also, they're faster. And so on. These are things that were meant to protect the women in the past, right? So the, the women, right, they'd have the children and they need somebody to protect them. But men get bigger at puberty when the testosterone kicks in. And more importantly, not only do they get taller and heavier, but their upper body strength is much higher. That's right. And that's a real issue for, for combat because human beings punch. There's other animals that do that. Kangaroos do that too, eh? So we're not the, we're not the only people that punch, but we have clubs on the ends of our arms. And so that's how we defend ourselves. And so if you have a lot of upper body strength, especially across the shoulders, and you're heavier, then you can step into the punch and it's a lot more devastating. Now, it's true. Also, it helps with throwing, which, you know, a lot of humans did in older times. You know, they would throw rocks, you know, with slings or javelins or that sort of thing, which this sort of thing helps with. Okay, shilling time. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, hit all for notifications. Go to my Patreon and subscribe, patreon.com slash the Helios blog. Drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian L, and Tom M. Just click more underneath the video in the video description. Links are there. And buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios books. Okay, let's continue. Shilling's done. Now, it is the case that if you look at the statistics for physical altercations in marriage, women attack their husbands more often than the husbands attack their wives. Why could that possibly be? Well, it's because women are less likely to do damage, right? And women are less afraid of, of breaking boundaries. Men know they can deal damage, and so they don't do it, right? And also, there's more. Men are trained from a young age to understand that there is physical consequences to their actions. So they learn to control their physicality from a young age. They learn not to fight. Um, very often, unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, you think, why is that? Well, let's assume that there isn't any reason other than both people in a relationship can get upset and the women know that if they hit their husbands, nothing's really going to happen, right? Because if you're a, rel you know, if you're a woman about that high and your husband is, say, my height, 
you're, unless you hit me with an object or something that's sharp, the probability that you're going to do me any serious damage is pretty low. Indeed. You might hurt me. But if I do the reverse and hit you, and I really hit you, and so the reason, at least one of the reasons why women can be more physically aggressive in minor ways in a relationship is because everyone knows, the wife and the husband equally, that the consequence of the physical aggression is much more limited. That's right. That's exactly right. And it's funny that they, that they know this, right? And some girls will even, like, jab at men for this. Oh, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to attack your uh, P word, you know? And, but really, the reason why guys don't do it is because they know what they can do if they really want to do it. So men do more serious damage to women, but women are more aggressive in relationships. So that's interesting. So, okay, so... There's a, there's a body size difference that's important, a strength differential that's important. Next thing, I think. Oh, and then there's this thing about men and women being equal. Well, they're not. If you look at sports, men are just better, right? And, and that's across every sport, pretty much. And there's a reason for that. It's because men are meant to be the fighters. So, of course, by biological, by evolutionary design, men are better at it. And sports, which are basically ritualized wars, men are better at that. So let's assume that the reason that women are higher in sensitivity to negative emotion is because the world is actually more dangerous to women, right? Because that would be the most logical reason why there would be a sex difference in, a sex difference in something like fear or sensitivity to punishment. Well, first, there's the danger of physical altercation. Second, there's the sexual danger. So women become sexually vulnerable at puberty. And why do I say vulnerable? Well, it's straightforward. It's because the cost of sex for women is way higher than it is for men. Or, and it certainly has been throughout our evolutionary history. That's for sure, because sperm is cheap and eggs are expensive. And, of course, the risk of men using their physicality to get bedroom fun exists. Although, of course, in 2023, it's not very high, but... It exists, of course. And there's more. Women are also very afraid of being expelled from the group. Because when a woman is alone, she's at a very high risk. And this is why women always do what's in fashion and are afraid of sticking out. They're afraid of standing out because they don't want to be shunned from the group. Because if they're shunned from the group, they're very vulnerable to being hurt in serious ways. A man can survive on his own, a woman can't, in the wild. Because if a man has an unwanted sexual encounter, well then he walks away and maybe he's persecuted by the state or prosecuted by the state for it. But if a woman has an unwanted, unwarranted or incautious sexual encounter and she ends up pregnant, then, well, in traditional societies, that's, you're just done. And even in modern societies that are rich like ours, you're, it's, it's a, I don't have to go into that. It's big trouble. No matter what you do about it, it's big trouble. So right, because if uh, women, you know, let's say, get rid of the child, they have psychological, negative psychological effects that happen as a result of that. So th there is a big risk to pregnancy for, for women. And this is why they want the sure bet, which is Chad, right? Because no matter when they... Should they have a child with Chad, no matter when, it's, it's positive for them. That's why they want only Chad. Because the risk of having Chad's child is pretty low. I mean, she could die, of course, although with modern medicine it's unlikely. But the genes are good. It's guaranteed good genes. So being, being more nervous about that makes perfect sense. But then here's the last thing. And I think that women's nervous systems are not adapted to women. I think women's nervous systems are adapted to the mother-infant dyad. And because you are not the same creature when you have an infant. Not at all. You're way more vulnerable. And it's partly because you have to express the vulnerability of the infant and you also have to care for it. Right? So you think about an infant, especially under nine months. So let's say, how are you going to be wired up if you're going to optimally care for an infant under nine months? And I, I'm saying under nine months because Women generally do the bulk of childcare for infants who are under nine months old. And part of the reason for that, there's a whole host of reasons, but part of the reasons for that, obviously, is that they breastfeed. 
But imagine what you need to be wired up biologically in order to care for an infant. First of all, they're very demanding, right? Because they're completely helpless, and they're demanding 24 hours a day, and it's quite, it, it's quite, uh, it's quite a emotional load. And an infant under nine months is never wrong, right? What you do to an infant under nine months is when they're in distress, you always respond. You never tell the infant. Get your act together and stop whining, right? Which you can do, say, to, an in, to a child that's 18 months old. You can start having that sort of conversation. But under nine months, it's like nothing is the infant's fault. It's surrounded in an extraordinarily threatening world. And you have to be responsive to what it needs, regardless of what you want. And you have to be very sensitive to the threats that emerge in the environment. And so I think the price that women pay for that ability to have an intimate relationship with infants in the very earliest stages of development is that their nervous systems are actually wired so that they can perform that role optimally. So what he's saying is women are more neurotic because that neuroticism helps them to communicate with the infant at a younger age. But there are negative consequences to this, which is that they're more neurotic, right? And it's really interesting that he would say under nine months is the is the dyad, right? That, they're, that the nervous systems are wired to be optimally suited for, implying that women should have more than one child, right? Their very biology implies they should have more than one child. Now, of course, in 2023, that's becoming harder and harder, right? Like these, these girls, be, just because of the way that the world works and the increasing prices, right? Women having more than one child is far less likely. But at, in that case, the part that they're most optimally wired for is only a very small fraction of their life, is, is what I'm getting at. And the disadvantage to that is that having a temperament like that doesn't work that well when you're dealing with adult men, especially when you're dealing with them in a business environment, it's true. because it's not the same thing. Not at all. It's a competitive environment. So, okay, so agreeable people are compassionate and polite. Yeah. In a business environment, it favors male traits, right? Being competitive, being disagreeable, fighting for what you want, striving, working hard, focusing on yourself and your goals and your responsibilities. Notice how that's not dyadic in nature. It's not du dualistic in nature. It's singular, right? There you go. What are disagreeable people like? They're tough-minded. They're blunt, they're competitive, and they won't do a damn thing they don't want to do. That's right. So it isn't exactly that they're aggressive, although they will push you the hell out of their way if you're in the way. They're not, they're not like volatile like you are if you're high in, in, in neuroticism. It isn't defensive aggression, it's more like predatory aggression. It's dominance behavior. And so for someone who's, high, who's high, highly disagreeable, they look at the world as a place in which they can compete and win. And I'll tell you a story. I have a friend. I gave him my personality test, the big five aspect scale that Colin DeYoung developed huh, in my lab. And uh, I knew he was a disagreeable guy And by interacting with him. Um, I mean, he's even rude to people sort of spontaneously on the street. I actually like him quite a bit. He's very, very funny. He's also very conscientious, so you can trust him. But he's disagreeable as hell. And, uh, so I gave him this test because I thought it would be funny, and he came out as the most disagreeable person in 10,000. So, reasonably, reasonable in, in compassion, about 30th percentile, but like 0 .001 in politeness. So he's extraordinarily blunt, and he'll just say absolutely anything, no matter how horrible it is. And he was often brought into corporations to sort of clean them up. So if a corporation was tilting and not doing well, they'd bring him in to find out who the useless people were and fire them. Right, and a person who's that disagreeable is not afraid of telling them, you're bad, get out. And I talked to him about that because I've had the miss opportunity to have to not have graduate students in my lab, for example, that weren't performing well, and I find it very, very difficult to, you know, dress someone down and certainly difficult to fire them. I just hate it because I'm actually quite an agreeable person, much to my chagrin. Okay, interesting. All right, let's continue with this.
So children, for example, when children are investigating potential play partners on the playground, they'll come up to a child, let's assume a child of roughly the same age, because that would be the most common situation. Maybe we're talking about kids who are four or five years old. And they'll throw out a play gesture that's rather simple, so maybe that a two-year-old could manage. And then if the person manages a proper response, then they throw out a little more sophisticated gesture. And if the person responds appropriately, then they ratchet up to just above their developmental level. And then they play like mad at that level. And that'll make them friends. Partly what they're testing for there continually is whether there's something approximating reciprocal altruism, right? It's tit for tat in the positive sense. And I would say that, well, we know there's actually a literature on this, which is quite interesting. This is also something very practical to know, and I'll get to another practicality here. So there have been psychologists who've done empirical investigations into what predicts the longevity of a relationship. And so here's one experiment that was conducted multiple times, and I believe this is very reliable data. So imagine you have the two partners in a marriage, each rate the number of encounters they have with their other partner a day, and it's kind of an arbitrary and subjective measure, but it doesn't matter. You might say, well, I talked to my wife eight times today. We had eight different interactions. And then you'd say, well, did you rate those for whether they're positive or negative? And then you can calculate a ratio of positive to negative. And then you can use the ratio to predict the longevity of the relationship. And the data show that if the relationship interactions fall below five positive to one negative, then the relationship deteriorates and is generally doomed. And so five to one, that's a proportion of positive interactions, but we're wired so that negative interactions hurt us more than positive interactions help us. Right, actually I, I know something about this. One positive interaction is about equal to four negative ones. That's why it needs to be five to one. Because even with one to, one to four, it's still beating that. So overall you'll feel like the interactions are positive. So it has to be five to one positive. There you go if they are of the same magnitude. So, for example, people will work harder to avoid a loss of $5 than they will to attain a gain of $5. And you might say, well, why is that? And the answer is, you can be absolutely dead, but there's only so happy you can be. And so it's bare to err on the side of conservatism in the domain of negative emotion. But, interestingly enough, if the interactions rise so that they exceed 11 positive to 1 negative, the relationship also deteriorates. And so what that suggests is that there's some it's sort of like smiles with teeth you yeah that's right uh, the reason why if it's 11 to 1 why it deteriorates is because women want man uh, a man with frame who's able to put in boundaries if the guy is agreeing with everything and and, and trying to to make everything positive for her with no boundaries then he's weak he's too agreeable He's not masculine. That's why she doesn't find it attractive. Very interesting. You want a fair bit of positive emotion and reflection from your partner, but you don't want them to be a naive, dependent pushover who's afraid to stand up for themselves. And so you want to, because you're a nasty, horrible human being, and now and then you poke your partner just to see if there's anything there, because that's what you're like. And if you find out there isn't, you'll run roughshod over them, and you think you won't, but you will, especially if they're very good at implicitly encouraging that, which dependent people sometimes are. So you do assess for reciprocity, and the basic rule is you want approximately equal re re reciprocity in relationships that you want to maintain. Right, I agree. And the reciprocity needs to be her giving a little bit more than you. Not, not much more, but a little bit more. And again, women will naturally do this because they're more agreeable. And they'll also naturally do this because if they're with you, they find you superior to them. So they have an incentive to keep you around but it should still be close. I agree. Now, maybe, you know, you have enough additional resource to be the giver more often than receiver in some relationships, but I don't even think that really works that well with children. You know, I mean, you obviously have to take care of them, but it's not like they don't deliver the goods to you if you have a good relationship with them. And you want to, to some degree, to enforce that reciprocity. Now, you might say, well, what happens in relationships where that's impossible? And, well, I give you a practical piece of a suggestion on that front. And this is another thing you can do in your own household. This is so useful, man. If, if you get good at doing this, your life will get so much better. You can't believe it. Is watch the people around you. And whenever they do anything that you would like to see repeated on a regular basis, 
tell them exactly what they did in detail, with be positive about it, obviously, <laughs> and just indicate that you noticed. And be Yes, that is called behaviorism. That is called positive reinforcement and it, act, it works so, so well. It works amazingly well. Just point out what it is that you like. Specifically, what I thought that you did that was very good was X. I really like when you do this. Thank you. I appreciate that you did this. Really, that will work so, so well because it's a positive way of putting in boundaries. The implication is the opposite, right? If you don't, if you don't do this, I don't like it. Although not always, it, it really does depend on the behavior. But that is called positive reinforcement and works amazingly well over the long term. This is how you train your girlfriend to have better behavior towards you over time through this method. I thought that was amazing. What great food you just made. Thank you for being so pleasant uh, just now. I really like how you phrased this. This is this was really cool. That was very thoughtful of you. Thank you. And so on. That sort of thing. Works wonders like you wouldn't believe. Because I saw this when I was grading student essays, you know. I taught this seminar for a long time and I was trying to teach kids how to write. They were in their fourth year of university in the honors psych program. You'd think they'd bloody well already know how to write, but they didn't. And so I'd have them write a four page essay on a given topic and then they had to rewrite that to a six page essay and then they had to rewrite that to an age, eight page essay. And the first essay I graded was only 5% of their grade. And I told them, I'm going to cut you into ribbons, but it doesn't matter because it's, you know, 5% of your grade. And so they could tolerate that. And generally by the third essay, they had written the best thing they'd ever written in their life. And they learned so fast, it was unbelievable. But one of the things I noticed was that they did a little testing with the first essay. They'd hand in something, it was just like, God, formulaic, boring. They're, they weren't in it at all, you know? There was nothing of the person in there. There was no thought. There was just the kind of psychobabble that they'd learned, especially if they were in faculties of education. And it was dry and dull and everything about it was wrong. And so those are hard to grade, right? So what's wrong with my essay? Well, the words aren't right. The phrases, they're not so good. They're not organized well into sentences. The sentences aren't sequenced well in the paragraphs. The paragraphs don't make a coherent argument and the entire thing is empty. But other than that, no problem. It was often easier just to rewrite those essays than to grade them. In any case, though, one of the things I did learn was that even in an essay like that, there is usually like one sentence or two sentences buried on like page three that was an actual thought and reasonably clearly stated and somewhat gripping, you know? It was like the person popped out from all the background rubbish and said, well, what about, what about this? <laughs> And if you saw that and checked it and said, hey, you hit the mark right there, the next essay would be like two thirds that. And that was really fun to see. And then. Right. Because people are searching for uh, what is that? Again, in psychology departments, it's mostly girls. Women are searching for approval and validation. So if you validate, bam, that's what you're going to see. So that's what you want. You want to reward the behavior you want to see. And you can even reward it, not just with words, but you can also reward it with actions, right? When you see good behavior, that's when you give something yourself. It, it can be a compliment. It can be pointing it out, but it can also be something else. It can be giving of a gift, or it can be saying of something nice, or it could be, you see what I'm saying? Those, the behavior gets paired to a good response from the other person. That's the idea. Maybe by the third essay, maybe it was all like that. And then they were really thrilled. It's like, wow, I wrote this, you know, and it's sort of the culmination. Well, it was a fourth year seminar. It was the culmination of their career as a psychology undergraduate. So that was great fun. But you can do that in your own household. If, Absolutely if, true. If, if the envious part of you isn't jealous of the revelation of the goodness of the person. What? And so here's the opposite tack, if you want to do this. So imagine that you're a man who's 
managed to attract a mate, and he believes he's punched above his weight. So this woman is more attractive, let's say, more vivacious, more desirable than he deserves. So that's gonna grate on his soul a fair bit, right? Partly because her shining casts a dim light on his lack of utility, let's yep, say. Right. So you can imagine someone like that being prone to jealousy Indeed. for obvious reasons. And so the best tact to manage in a situation like that, if you're that man, is to wait till your wife dresses herself up in a particularly attractive manner and then either fail to notice by occupying yourself with something trivial while she's attempting to gain your attention or by criticizing her directly for what she's just managed to do. Yeah, don't do that. If you want your girl to be at her best for you, you have to reward her for doing it. You have to compliment her. You have to point it out. You have to say that she looks amazing and so on. Because those compliments are what keep the behavior going. She's not doing it because of how she's dressing. She's doing it to get that positive attention from you. That's what she's trying to do. And if you do that 50 times, let's say, you can be sure that she'll never reveal her attractiveness to anyone else for the rest of her life, including you. And you'll get exactly Indeed. what you deserved. Right. So that's the opposite of watching people carefully. Now, I learned this in part from Skinner, B.F. Skinner, the famous... Right, he's talking about behaviorism. I, I pointed that out immediately animal behaviorist because he used all sorts of reinforcement contingencies to shape animal behavior and Skinner was unbelievably good at this he trained pigeons in World War II to guide missiles by pecking at photographs so they could map the photographs onto the missile trajectory viewing the territory underneath and peck accurately enough to guide the missile to its destination what that was discontinued hell? as the technology for guided missiles developed that's actually incredible what <laughs> I actually can't believe you did that. I didn't know that story. That's crazy. Okay, I don't think that. Yeah, there's no better. There's no better place to end. If if Skinner could train pigeons to guide missiles, you can definitely reinforce the kind of behavior you want in your girl. It's easier than that. Believe me. All right, we're going to end the video there. Hit the like. Hit the subscribe. Hit all for notifications. Drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian R, and Tom M. Go to my Patreon and subscribe, patreon.com slash the Helios blog. Buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios books. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I really do appreciate it, especially if you listen to the end. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.